um, cooking, washing, cleaning. A-level students studying for exams next summer, not knowing whether or not those exams will go ahead. What can this graph tell us? It's an uncertainty schools like this one in Driffield say needs to be sorted out. 24 academies have written to the exams watchdog demanding answers. Why was there a delay in deciding what assessment would replace this year's exams? Second, should exam fees paid by schools out of taxpayers' money be reduced? And third, and most important, what is the plan for next summer? I think what there needs to be is much more choice for students about what topics they cover, what they answer. So it's a big piece of work the exam boards need to do, but it's vital they do it because otherwise there is going to be an issue about fairness again next summer and there's no reason why we should be in that position when we've got a year's notice. Daisy is in her final year and knows how hard this year's confusion has been. With psychology, I was already worried about my subject anyway, so knowing that we might have exams and then they were cancelled and then we didn't know what we were doing, the, the whole confusion of it was just really hard for all of us. Thomas's final exams are next year, a date that's even more concerning to him after he didn't have to revise for GCSEs last year. We're hoping we can do exams, but we'd like to know whether we actually are, because um, in terms of what we're learning, are they going to be shorter? Do we miss out bits of content? Or do we just learn the whole thing and hope we have to? Teaching unions say students like Thomas need clarity sooner. They need to be made clear before the end of this term so that teachers and pupils and parents have got a chance to understand what the assessment process will be next year and parents to support their pupils, pupils to work and teachers to arrange the teaching and learning and assessment. In response, the exams watchdog says teachers are best placed to assess what students have learned amid the disruption caused by the pandemic. As for next year, government policy is that exams should take place, but contingency planning is underway. It's that very caveat which is leaving students like these facing more weeks and months of uncertainty. James Webster, ITV News, Driffield. It's a street that should be bustling with people in and out of every shop front. But on Hull's White Frigate, for every two stores that are open, one stands empty. Walking down here, we can see there are a third of the shops that are empty. What do you make of it? Well, it's not an ideal situation, but this street isn't representative of Hull City Centre per se. The organisation that markets the city centre admits this street does have a problem. Well, what we'd like to see down here is a good support from independents. We'd like to see more food and beverage businesses, and we know in, the interest is there. It's just making sure that we can support them, making sure they see all the opportunities, all the great events that are going to be happening in the city that will drive footfall and bring people into those units. Across the city around 10% of shops are empty but here things are much worse. There are 45 shops on this street, 30 are occupied, 15 have the doors locked or the shutters down. So what's this unit we've got here then? This is a former uh, bakery, hot food outlet. Those marketing empty premises worry high rents could put some off. A number of landlords are realistic and they will move with the market, your, your um, running costs of a premises are your business rates and your rent, but if you can tackle at least one of those being rent, then hopefully that will make it more a viable option. This comes as the city promotes its 2017 cultural programme. Whitewashed windows, not such a good advert according to some. I think they need more shops, different ones, different ones not the same shops opening all the time. We was in Lincoln yesterday and every one of them was full of it's just a shame for Hull, really. There's beautiful buildings, all that kind of stuff around. Docks, shore, you know, we've just been tipped deep. And this lets it down, I think, so... Yeah, it does. Yeah. The City Council hopes its £25 million revamp of public spaces will attract new business, along with some financial help. We don't imagine that overnight suddenly every single unit is going to be full. Um, this is about a, a long-term approach to investment, to draw in private sector investment, help the current retailers down here um, over a number of years. Uh, we've managed to draw in um, some grant funding through the LEP, about 800k of grant funding. It's specific for the old town and the sport is looking at business startups and also improvements to units to make them available uh, for, for end users. 
This store opened in the last three months. We was market stall for uh, sort of two and a half years um, in the local Princess Quay. Um, we just outgrew it. You know, it's just going fantastic. We need to get more shops full, um, whatever they are. But as yet, no more have followed, which is why the city will pitch itself to leading national retailers at a conference later this month. We've got lots and lots of special things, but there is only one UK City of Culture 2017, and that's all. And we think that's a massive message to take forward. And you put all that together and brand whole becomes very attractive. New businesses now have just four months to get their doors open to take advantage of the extra visitors for City of Culture. James Webster, ITV News, Hull. The tail end of Storm Callum battered large areas of Northern Ireland and northwest England overnight. And in Wales, it flooded homes and businesses, causing misery and heartache for many. James Webster reports from Aberdeleis in South Wales. They've been clearing water here all day. This is the aftermath of Storm Callum, which posed its biggest threat here overnight. Police knocked at four o'clock this morning with a bus to evacuate, but none of us really want to leave because this is our home, so we don't really want to go anywhere. Um, we've packed the children up and sent them away, and this afternoon then it's just all started coming through the floor. And my granddad passed away and left me his piano, and it's really sentimental to me, so I want to make sure that is okay. Heavy rainfall yesterday has swollen both the river and the canal here to levels not seen in many years. I've been here for 14 years and it's never been this bad before. We've had a few alerts but it's never actually come in the back of the houses. Um, but uh, I think the last time it flooded was 1985. The drains must have backed up extremely quickly. Um, I've only been in since April as well. so. Um, I'm hoping that the, uh, the rain will stop. This village is just one example of the widespread disruption across South Wales. Thousands of homes have been without power, trains have been cancelled and roads closed. The potential risks are a concern to the area's officials. We put evacuation um, procedures in place and those who wanted to be evacuated have been evacuated, have been moved. Um, a lot of them I think are in the Aberdeleis Legion or there have been alternative measures put in place as well. I think a few of them didn't want to leave um, but obviously if there's a major concern then we will try and encourage them to move from the property. Businesses too are counting the cost. This golf club should have been hosting an 80th birthday party. The building itself is on stilts. Uh, but unfortunately I think it's penetrated the building. Uh, there's obviously going to be some water damage inside, hopefully not too much, uh, but we just want to get back to business as soon as possible. The cleanup here can only begin when the water subsides, flooding, which is the worst people have seen here in a generation. Well, tonight the river level here remains high. It's fast flowing and carrying debris. The bridge here also remains closed, as are many other flood affected routes across Wales. There is still an amber warning for heavy rain in place till six o'clock tonight. That's in around 40 minutes' time. Then it's downgraded just one level to a yellow warning until midnight. Right now, there are 28 flood warnings and 43 flood alerts, with the potential for hills to channel more water down to here. The risk of further flooding hasn't gone away yet. All right, James Webster, many thanks. Yes, welcome to the main auditorium here at Hull Truck Theatre, where, as you can see, the stage is literally set for the latest production. It's Abigail's Party. Now, you may remember earlier on this year, the theatre published this video introducing a new push it was having on attracting more diverse actors to audition for roles here. There was a bit of a feeling that there could be some talent out there that was being missed, that wasn't getting the opportunities that they deserved, and they wanted to make sure they were attracting them here for productions. And a couple of the cast members from Abigail's party have joined me now. Annie, you play uh, Angela in the play. Um, just tell us a little bit about the play, first of all. Yeah, well, it's a very well-known play. It was set in 1977, and basically it's a night in suburbia, um, five people in a room that might not usually be in the same room, and it just examines their relationships, but also 
has like a, a look on class and then our, in our production it focuses on race um, through mine and Daniel's character so um, it's quite exciting. And what attracted you to the role? Um, it was the character. Um, I think what Amanda's doing is by trying to uh, change the traditional view of the characters uh, by making my character and Daniel's character from Jamaican background. Um, that was really enticing. I've never seen anything like that before. Um, it's such a classic play so I was really excited to, to have a go at it. <laughs> it sounds like it's going really well. Thank yeah. you. Daniel, um, explain to us, as an actor from a BAME background, is there a feeling that there aren't necessarily the opportunities and that you do need to be having more of the ideas like this to try to get more people like you into roles? Yes, I think <laughs> that this is really exciting. I think that what Amanda's done is amazing and I think that historically stories like this that have been made with, you know, casts that are all one particular representation or demographic do have the capacity to change and to develop and to grow and to speak for all of society. Um, how important is it that you get those opportunities? I think it's very important for, well, for me personally, because I need to, you know, work and eat and stuff, <laughs> but also for um, society as well, because if people aren't represented and they don't feel that they have a voice in society, then that's, that's not good, you know? So it's good for everybody to be able to be seen and to be heard. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it is six months since this push on diversity here was introduced. Amanda uh, is from the theatre. Amanda, how is this going? How much of an impact is it having? It's had a really big impact. People were surprised by the choices that I made with Abigail's party. But for me, it's exactly as it should be. It's 41 years of doing it possibly the same way. Let's look at it in another way. And for me, when I read that script, I could see absolutely why this family could possibly be a Jamaican family introduced into this uh, community because we've been here for a while now. And are you getting more talent in? Very much so. Um, people who have been historically benched, who have been underrepresented, are now having a chance to really show and shine alongside everybody else, and it's been really exciting. Thank you very much indeed. Well, this push on diversity here has just started. It's hoped it will continue to have an impact on the shows here in the months and years ahead.